My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and of course, FOMO Sapiens 24-7. 365. Now, we are going to start a series of episodes where we get into some creativity. We're talking to people who do creative things, work in creative industries, are creative entrepreneurs, are experts on the subject. So I just think it's good in the cold of winter, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, or in the steamy heat of the summer, if you're down South. <laughs> Look at I've just made this work for everybody. Even the people on the equator, we just got to get more creative because creativity is a power. It's a superpower that we lose over time, a lot of times, because institutions bang it out of us, but we can get it back. Now, we're going to talk to somebody today who has one of the coolest jobs I've ever, ever heard of, and she uses social proof combined with celebrity to get things done. Now, who is this person? Her name is Robin Bronk, and she's the CEO of the Creative Coalition. What is that? It's the leading national nonprofit, nonpartisan social and public advocacy organization of the arts and entertainment industry. And basically what she does is educate, mobilize, and activate the entertainment industry and arts community on issues of public importance, particularly the First Amendment, arts advocacy, arts and education, and media literacy. Now, she does a lot of things. So Robin's really interesting. She pens a column in the Hill newspaper. She has a radio show about independent film. She started her career on Capitol Hill. And now, I mean, again, coolest job in the world. Who are her colleagues? Who does she work with? Jason Alexander, Alyssa Milano. Her boss is Tim Daly, who's chairman of the board. So it's just very cool. And I met her via John Levy, who came on the show. And we talked about networking, as you remember, last season. And I was at one of his networking events. I met Robin. We hit it off. I got involved with what she does, the Creative Coalition. And I actually got to spend a day with her and Jason and Alyssa and others lobbying on Capitol Hill. And I don't know how I got invited. I felt like, why would anybody want to talk to me when they could talk to Jason Alexander? But listen, it was super, super cool. And we're going to talk about that today in the conversation. And you're going to learn a bunch of stuff. First, you're going to learn about how you can use social proof to drive change. How do you get celebrities and other people or use your own influence to get things done? Second, we're going to talk about how you can do a million things and do them well, just like Robin. She's kind of got her hand in a lot of pots, total FOMO sapiens, but she's highly effective. And finally, we're going to talk about how you can make sure that when you're advocating for something, it's not just words, it's deeds, because what's the worst thing in the world is people who say one thing and do another. And so nobody wants to be like that. And I think Robin has a lot of insight into that. Now, I have some good news. My small ask is a fun one. Go check me out on Robin's show. So this week, Robin's podcast with me as the guest came out. It's called At Home with the Creative Coalition. And it's a super cool podcast. So this is, again, like I'm like pinch myself because I don't know how I get in the mix, but she's had people like Patricia Heaton, Alfre Woodard, Jason Alexander, who, as you can tell, I super like, and little old me. And again, I just, please go listen to it because I don't think people are like, why? She done an episode with this dude. And so uh, check it out. We had a really cool conversation and, and she's a great interviewer. All right. And now onto the interview. As you know, I like to start every interview with the same question. And I did not change that for my friend Robin. I started out by asking her this. What's the most important decision that you've had to make to get to where you are today? I, I admit it. I had no plan A. I had no plan B. I had no plan, which is probably really irresponsible. But... um the most important decision I had to get to where I am today, I think it was more later it, well, when I when I leaped over to the Creative Coalition from my Washington career, and I remember having a um, a conversation with the chairman, of who, the gentleman who was the chairman of the board then, and I I kept basically I wanted I wanted assurance of success, and he finally and he was great and he would he finally said. You know, there's no there's no guarantees. Does this speak to you? If it does, then do it. And so I did. And it was really scary because I had three little kids to take care of, uh, five and under. And I always thought I was a risk taker till it, I, I 
took me a while to take this this position, and it was the greatest decision. So you took this path, no guaranteed success, but clearly you're doing something right because your life, I mean, you mentioned you had three kids, you went to join the Creative Coalition, and later on, somebody makes a TV show, the Gina Davis show, which ran for a couple of years, starring, of course, Gina Davis, who, as I remember, is a FOMO sapiens herself because she's an actress, but also, I think, tried to get into the Olympics for archery. They made the show about a character with three kids who's, who was running this thing called the Creative Caucus, which I like how they, <laughs> they kept it still with the, the C in there. And about your, kind of about your life and inspired by this unique path you've taken. So, you know, tell me, tell all of us really, like what, what you do, what the Creative Coalition is and why somebody would want to make a TV show about it. <laughs> well, I know, I don't know if I can answer the last part of it, why someone made a TV show about it, but... And the backstory is kind of cool, I think. It's my mother and her best friend since kindergarten, Joni Minsky. Joni's, you know, they would talk about their kids, you know, to each other. They do still all the time. And Joni's daughter, Terry, is an award-winning television writer and creator. Um, Among others, um, she had Lizzie McGuire was her Mm -hmm. creation. And I guess her mother talked to her and told some stories and there was some sort of fascination about, you know, this working mom with three kids, three little kids who was also, you know, running this side of Hollywood, the, the, uh, the advocacy side of Hollywood. So Gina Davis played the director of the creative, what was called the creative caucus and Peter Horton played her husband and it, she had three kids and, um, it was uh, funny to watch, and she did she did it with so much more grace than I do. I mean, she was living life and looking like Gina Davis and acting like Gina Davis, and um, you know, I was kind of stumbling through the real life version of it. And so, I, I think that that was the um, it was the juxtaposition of being a working mom and having to do all the working mom things of you know figuring out how to you know make dinner and deal with conference calls and um, be in a couple different time zones at once and making sure that, you know, your your kid had lunch, you know, at least some semblance of something in a brown bag. And I think the reason why somebody would make a show about it is because it's sexy. You know, you work in in an organization that partners with celebrities, household names to drive change using their platform, their messaging, their advocacy. So, you know, that, that does, you know, that, that, that's made for TV. So yeah, tell us about the work that you're doing, the Creative Coalition, the kinds of people that are involved and, and, and that you've been able to bring in over the years. It's so funny. I do love what I do. I love it, love it, love it. But it is, it's like catnip hearing about celebrity and, you know, oh, you were here and, and there, or you were, you know, on Capitol Hill with celebrities and, the first thing is the people that I work with are activists and parents and community leaders who happen to be actors. They're parents first. They're act- activists first. Um, and what I always say is, you know, some people sometimes will say, oh, they're just doing it for the publicity. Well, guess what? Being an activist, half your fans will never agree with what you're doing. You are putting your job on the line. You are putting your family on the line. But you're doing it for something you believe in. So I always have to, especially people in the public eye, when they do become activists, I give them a lot of credit, a lot a, a lot of credit, because half of their fans, half of their, their people who pay their livelihood will not like what they're doing. But they're doing it because they believe in it. And as for glamour, there's really nothing glamorous about walking door to door on Capitol Hill on on hard marble floors that really do hurt your feet. And um, it's it's usually hot and stuffy and you have to repeat the same thing every single time, but you're doing it and, and they're doing it because they dearly believe in the cause. FOMO. So let's talk about, for example, Capitol Hill. You just mentioned that. And you and I, so I'm just full, I think, you know, I'm not a super uber famous person, but um, I am involved in the Creative Coalition. I met Robin through a former guest of the show, John Levy, and we hit it off right away. And Robin invited me to join 
when uh, members of the Creative Coalition went to Capitol Hill and spoke to members of Congress to advocate for funding for National Endowment of the Arts. So I got to see this firsthand. And it was really cool because there were some pretty major people on the Zoom, as we say. Not only were there members of Congress, but there were some actors from shows like Grey's Anatomy. And there was the great Jason Alexander, who we all know as George Costanza. So it was really incredible to be in that room. But I guess, how do, how do you take a group of people like that to actually get members of Congress to to fund the things that you want them to fund that, that support the arts. Well, and the other thing is I, I do have to say, Patrick, that in this, this past year, you have been the biggest celebrity that I've met. And it was so excited about because I am a lifelong member of the FOMO club and I've, I'm trying so hard to outgrow it, but I don't know. There's no hope. And now that I've met you, I feel like, you know, I have to keep FOMO alive. (laughs) 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 But um, as far as it's very interesting. So so the way we do our advocacy and and probably the way any other um, advocacy organization does it is that it's strategic. So we look at, you know, we, we look at who are the members of Congress who are adversaries the piece of legislation, who are um, supporters of it, and how do we shore up the support and perhaps make a dent in our advers- in our adversaries. And then we also go through our own um, community, our database, and say, well, um, just for example, uh, Jason Alexander it grew up in New Jersey. He has family in New Jersey. He means something to New Jersey. What member of the Appropriations Committee is from New Jersey? Let's get Jason together with this member. So it's all strategic. It's not happenstance. That's sort of grassroots and um, advocacy 101. So then how do we use it in a strategic manner to move a piece of legislation that will support the common good? And see, so we that that's what we do, and that's what's in the background. And the end result is that we then go to Capitol Hill physically and in years of a non-pandemic and via Zoom other years to um, set up these meetings to win win the piece of legislation, to win that um, amount of money that should be allocated for the arts. Because that at the end of the day, we do a lot of things. We have a vaccine PSA where, where we are promoting, uh, you know, getting vaccinated. We have a lot of different issue campaigns. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about the arts. How do the arts make an impact? And we, we happen to live in a nation where really our citizenry doesn't care that much about spending money and funds on the arts. And we have accepted it. And again, thinking like a strategist, what what does our country care about? Well, there's a lot of different issues and how does the arts impact that? And we bring that, you know, how does the arts impact economic development? How how does the arts impact um, prison recidivism? So we use the arts to showcase how community can be better. Now, you've been doing this for a while and you've witnessed the rise of social media and the fact that nowadays when, you know, some of the people that you work with, the celebrities that are part of the Creative Coalition, you know, they they have these, these huge platforms on social media. And I'm curious how you think the work that you do has changed as a result that not only do people have massive sort of platforms via Instagram and Twitter and all the others, but also like, I think the, the world has changed. Celebrities are more political now than they used to be, right? Especially Gen Z and, and, and some of the younger folks, like they're really out there talking about politics. So does that make your work harder or easier or, or does it change it at all? Well, it's interesting too. I think there's just more of an awareness of celebrity advocacy, because if you go back in in the in history, Joan Crawford lobbied for Pepsi because she was married to the CEO of Pepsi. So it's just with social media and with infinite amount of media covering the movements of celebrity, it's way more apparent. Um, so it, it, there's also you know, there's an expectation, I think this expectation is probably at least a decade old, that if one is a quote-unquote celebrity, 
they have their agent, they have their manager, they have their publicist, and they have their issue. So there is this white hat. And again, it's sort of like corporate social responsibility. You know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, no one, you know, that wasn't a term. And now there are every company, every um, pint of ice cream that you get or every, you know, uh, water that you're drinking has a social a social issue connected to it. And I think that's the same with celebrity too. And there is, there's a recognition that the platform of entertainment is a tremendously both inspirational and, and can influence both for the bad and for the good. And it, there is a movement, and I think the movement is probably about a decade old, to use that superpower to serve the common good. Now, you could choose to do a lot of different things, right? There are so many big issues out there that need, obviously, to be addressed. And also, I imagine within the group of people you work with, you work with tons of different people that are that are bold-faced names. And many of them have issues that they feel passionately about. I'm curious, as you think about this, you know, how do you choose, right? You could have massive FOMO and want to want to cover 53 different issues, but that doesn't make sense. You have to choose a couple of things. So what's your thought process for deciding what you're going to focus on? We take on issues where we believe we can make a positive difference. There's rarely an issue that um, leaders in it don't want the entertainment industry involved. And, and, and people come to us all the time with a myriad of great issues. And and we have to put the issue through a test Meaning, can we make a difference? Can we make a positive difference? Can we make sure we make a positive difference um, using the resources of the entertainment industry without detracting from the issue? So we take on issues that also that, that are we call orphan issues. And it's funny because orphan issues you think of of issues that don't affect that many people. But there's also orphan issues that can affect mass numbers of the population that no one else is taking on. And we did that with the issue of mental illness, of helping to normalize mental illness and to take the stigma away from mental illness. And we worked very closely with Patrick Kennedy and the actor Joe Pantoliano um, really led the charge. And we worked lockstep Um, with some leaders on Capitol Hill, with um, leaders in the mental health community to help normalize the stigma and and destigmatize mental illness. We did it with the issue of bullying. You know, bullying was sort of a throwaway. Ah, it's not really happening. Ah, I don't know if we, we have to deal with it. And we worked with state legislatures to put into place legislation. And we also, we brought it, we also will bring in partners. And on that, we brought in many different allied organizations, uh, ranging from education organizations to um, children's organizations to be allies in that we were all, again, um, working from the same Bible to try and eradicate bullying. Now, a lot of people, when they when they see a celebrity advocating for something, you know, you're right. Like half of the fan base of that person, if it's something, contra- if it's not like if it's like bullying, I think nobody nobody's going to be like that's terrible. Well, no right? one's. But, but you know what? It's interesting. No one's for bullying. No one's actually against the arts. No one, just because they don't want to give public funding to it, which is what we strongly believe in, it doesn't mean that they're against the arts. It just means that we're not for funding it through federal funds. Where no one is, you know, know, no one is pro-bullying, but they might not want their state legislature. They might want to to put funds towards anti-bullying, an anti-bullying curriculum. So it really, you have to, it, it really is a fine thread through a needle that you have to understand how to go go it get into an issue i mean our our newest issue is um destigmatizing what we call the last shame and blame disease of obesity which is different than body positivity and again we're working with writers directors producers executives in the entertainment industry to destigmatize obesity, that it is a, a disease, that it should not be shameful, that treatments or seeking treatment and seeking health care should not be something that is shameful. And it's it's a difficult one because 
it's not anti-body positivity. It really has nothing to do with body positivity. It's a separate issue. It's a disease where it's the only disease where people are ashamed to say, I'm getting treatment for it. It's treated sort of like epilepsy was 100 years ago um, when someone said, well, you know, or mental illness. If you just are a better person and you smile more, you won't have seizures or you won't have mental illness. And we know that's absurd. And uh, it's the same way. Obesity is not um, just about, you know, it's about making healthy decisions, but it's also getting health care when you need it. And that's okay. FOMO. FOMO. Yeah, it is an, a surprisingly controversial issue because, and we've talked about this in the past, that you, you, you can say very credibly, I have obesity because it is, it is a medical condition, but people will, there's a lot of emotions around that. Well, oh, are you saying that it's not okay to be body positive? Or are you saying that that person isn't taking responsibility? It's a much more complex issue than that. And getting the word on that is really important. Now, when you work with celebrities to talk about these things or when you, you know, for example, with this, I, I know you're talking to showrunners and writers to try to get them to write these things into their shows so that people just, it becomes normalized and it becomes part of the conversation. But as you do that, you know, I think these days also people can get to a point where they they start to question how real these things are. You know, the celebrity keeps on talking about everything. You know, how, how do you make sure that the messages are real, that people are using social proof in a way that feels authentic versus just, you know, stuff that just doesn't really, doesn't land because people don't feel like it's authentic. Like what's the key to making it authentic? Well, the key for us is the key at the Creative Coalition is we don't take on that many issues every year. We really focus like a laser beam on a particular issue. We educate ourselves, not so that we're experts in that issue because we aren't, we are the messengers. We're expert at messenger messengering. Um, but we educate, we then activate our membership, and then mobilize our membership. You, again, but always bringing in allies who are the substantive people. Um, we, and messaging is as important. We are, we, are, we are excellent messengers. We are experts at messaging, but we need the substance. So we are, we're not, we want to be in the background of that. We want to bring, we, we can get the door open, but we need to bring the substance people in. Yeah, you so need just, the steak and the sizzle. Right, exactly. We need that, you know, nutritional, the, the foundation of whatever the issue is. And, but again, again, what's our mission? Our mission is to promote the efficacy of the arts. And if the arts can be the best messenger, well, why wouldn't we get more money put into the arts and more uh, time put into the arts? Now, Robin, successful people say no all the time. I read your bio and you do a lot of things, right? But I, I and, <laughs> as I do too, but I know you say no to a lot of things. So how do you know when to say no and how do you, how do you say it? What, what's your secret? That is such a great question because I remember when I worked in Washington, D.C. for a uh, firm, a public affairs firm, and my boss had to teach me how to say no. Mm. Because just say, saying yes all the time doesn't do you or whoever you're trying to help any good because y you're not discerning. And you're some, yeah. So I say no, but I do try to give whoever I'm talking to a better avenue. Like I'm not the right person, but here's someone who can help you. So it's not passing the buck, which as I'm listening to, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's also, I say no to things where I'm not the best person to be helping. And I'm not all things to all people, but I can't, I do know almost all people. <laughs> so <laughs> I can certainly, I'm a good resource to help you help someone figure out where to go. And I'm a good researcher too. So that helps me say no, because I have no qualms about saying I am not the best person for this. Now, you're clearly a FOMO sapiens. You're also a human being. And that means you feel FOMO sometimes. You admitted it. I mean, 
Uh, I knew that about you already, but I guess, you know, how do you manage those feelings? Because it can be, especially I can only imagine you get invited to a gazillion things, but you have to, you have to work and you have a family. How, How do you manage the FOMO so that you can do the things you need to do? I don't know if it's harder now or when my kids were growing up and I was really stretched and you know, I'm a lifelong FOMO in the fo- lifelong FOMO club. I'm really trying to get out of that club, Patrick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to turn in my lifelong membership. You know, it's even especially in these COVID times or these, are we in the pandemic? Are we not in a pandemic? Half the world thinks we are, half the world. And I was just invited to a mo- movie premiere for next week. And it's good, you know, it's about networking and good for business. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, before the pandemic, I would have been there in the second. And now, uh, I don't know that I'm ready to go inside with all those people, but, oh, am I going to miss, <laughs> am I going to miss out? Am I going to miss out on that business deal, that connection, that whatever it is? So I, I don't know. It's new territory to, because it used to be very cut and dried. I could, you know, I, I try to stretch myself to be in two places at once. I'm very comfortable doing that. <laughs> and, um, but this one is, you know, we're not really sure where health and safety and where we're, sp- you know, there's that, there's that factor now too. So I, I'm really just navigating that and I'm not comfortable with where I am right now to be, perfectly honest i'm not sure um what's appropriate in in being in the human well the good news is we do a a session on the show uh, every once in a while called fomo therapy so you can come back and oh, uh, please, we'll, we'll deal with up. you we'll put you we'll, you just call me when you're ready to go and we'll have you on it, it are you finding that it's so hard though now to because now you have to put in not just your time and okay Maybe you need like a couple hours sleep. I never really subscribed to that either. But, you know, what's the most appropriate balance? I had to tell you, I think what's changed for me, having been through the pandemic, is I know what it's like to have nothing on my plate. And so I find that when I'm overdoing it, I'm way more sensitive than I was before. And I sort of say to myself, like, this isn't fun right now. I'm, I'm overextended. I'm saying yes to too many things. And I, if I'm pining for the couch, then I know it's time to dial it back. Yeah, it's a lot more navigating it than we used to have to do. Yeah. We'll have you back for FOMO therapy. But in the meantime, if you want to learn more about Robin, you can find her on Twitter at rbronk. That's R-B-R-O-N-K. And you can find more about The Creative Coalition on Twitter at The Creative C and on Instagram at The Creative Coalition. Robin Bronk, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. FOMO. Can't get enough of FOMO sapiens? Join me on Patreon for ad-free episodes, bonus material, and exclusive content that will help you to master FOMO and position yourself for greater success in both business and life. Go to patreon.com slash FOMO sapiens to learn more. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I love hearing from you, so don't be shy. FOMO sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO.